I guess you all know what my topic is. I'm going to be talking about um, a health issue. I'm going to be talking about cancer, and I'll be, I'll be especially talking about an alternative treatment for cancer, more commonly known as Laetrile, a very controversial substance that was very much in the news back in the 1970s when I first became involved in it. Um, the mission that I have today is to put together a couple of uh, rather major topics into one, hopefully, a shorter version of the uh, what could actually be a whole day seminar if we had the stamina for it or the intelligence, both of which we are lacking. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is the politics of cancer therapy, primarily. But before we do that, I'll be talking a little bit about the science of cancer therapy also. And before I do that, I don't want to run the risk of having it slip my mind. I'd like to introduce and acknowledge my wife, Patricia, right sitting right here. <laughs> and it, it's especially significant that I should do that, not only because it's pretty rare that she gets to go along. She doesn't say it, but I know she thinks that she hears me talk enough. She doesn't have to come out here to do that, more of it. But um, she has plenty else to do, that's the truth. Uh, but it's significant today because on this topic, um, Pat is an author and an expert on her own right. She has uh, written a book, uh, co-authored it with uh, Dr. John Richardson, MD, who's now deceased. But Dr. Richardson had a, a cancer clinic, a very thriving cancer clinic up in the San Francisco area uh, in the 70s when all of this was transpiring. And uh, Pat went up and assisted him in pulling together all of the patient records from his clinic. And after many months of uh, working on those records and interviewing patients and uh, pulling it all together, uh, we published a book called Laetrile Case Histories, and she's the co-author of that. We have some of the copies of her book here, uh, in case you're interested. I know she'd be happy to autograph them, and uh, you'd be very impressed by what's in there. These are real case histories of real people. This is not just theory. I'll be talking about theory uh, shortly, but in her treatise, we're talking about actual results, and uh, you can't argue with that. So, uh, okay. I have a lot of ground to cover, so we'll get right to it. it I look back on, on all of this history, and it seems like it happened a thousand years ago to me, and I remember the first time I ever heard the word laetrile was in the summer of 1971. I mentioned Dr. John Richardson a moment ago. He was a good friend of uh, ours. And occasionally I would get together with Dr. John and we'd sort of get out of town and get away from the telephones and the usual helter-skelter of business and uh, go off and pretend like we were uh, uh, hunting or something like that. We never did any hunting. Uh, my father was the fisherman. I've never done any fishing. But anyway, it was a good cover story just to get away. We'd go up into Northern California or, uh, or possibly uh, Oregon, and uh, we'd um, just take some time off and look at the beautiful countryside and uh, enjoy it. Well, this one particular occasion, I knew I was in trouble. There was something different because John brought his briefcase with him. That was almost like an unmentionable, unforgivable sin. You don't bring your briefcase on these trips. But he brought his briefcase with him, and as soon I found out that the reason he did that is that he'd, he'd gotten into trouble with the local medical authorities because he was using an unapproved substance in the treatment of his cancer patients. And the story that he told me was kind of astounding. He said that uh, uh, he had been introduced to this substance. It was called Laetril. He didn't know anything about it, but uh, uh, he didn't have much faith in it because, after all, it wasn't approved. It didn't come from the medical establishment, and he certainly didn't know anything about it uh, from his education. But somebody said that it was very effective and he should try it. Uh, he was not having particularly good results in treating cancer patients, pretty much the same story as most doctors. And he said, well, I'll give anything a try. And so he had a dog that has cancer, and there was no way to cure the dog. The dog was not responding to any of the orthodox treatments, and they were going to have to put the animal down. So he thought, well, let's give it a try. And much to his amazement, the dog recovered. 
It didn't take very long before one of the nurses on his staff, who had a member of the family with incurable cancer, came to him and said, look, I saw what this did with the dog. Can we try it on the member of my family? And he said, well, I don't know whether we dare do that or not. She said, What's, what have we got to lose? This person is not going to make it anyway. So they tried it, and the patient recovered. So there were two rather dramatic instances in his life which made him go back and take a very serious look at this thing called Laetrile. And he met the inventor, Dr. Uh, well, not the inventor, the discoverer, I should say, Dr. Ernst T. Krebs, Jr., had many conferences with him, became familiar with the, the theory, the science behind it, and began to cautiously use it in his practice. And he went from a, a terrible... Uh, loss rate, I, I guess you would call it that, where he was losing most of his patients that he was treating with cancer. He went from that to a high success rate, almost overnight, by using this substance. And so he became very enthusiastic about it. The word got around, his patients were very happy, of course, and they told their friends. It wasn't very long before people were coming from all over the United States, and in some cases even from Europe, to be treated at the Richardson Clinic. Then he got into trouble with the medical authorities. The hospital uh, administration contacted him and said, you have to stop using this material because it is not approved by the FDA. And he said, yeah, I know it's not approved, but it works. They said, we don't care whether it works or not. It is not an approved substance and you're in violation of the law. Dr. John was a very principled person. He had his Hippocratic Oath, which he felt uh, very uh, strongly about. He wanted to save lives. He had to choose between bucking the establishment, risking his own license, or saving lives. And so he chose the path that only he could have taken. He decided to fight for the right, uh, for the, the truth, and to treat his patients with Laetrile. That's where I entered the picture. I didn't know any of that was going on until this trip, and he had his briefcase with all of these papers and uh, diagrams and things. He said, you know what I want you to do, Ed, since you are a communicator, supposedly, and I'm a doctor, he said, why don't you communicate this idea? I'd like to write a magazine article and have it published someplace so we can explain how this works, why it works, and the results we're getting, and then they'll get off my back. They'll get off my case, and I can go ahead and practice medicine seemed like a rational thing. So I said, well, John, I'll give it a try, but you're telling me that there are people in the medical establishment, there are people out there who are consciously holding back, holding back a control for cancer? I said, that's impossible. Who, who are they, John, that would do such a thing? And with the asking of that question, who are they, John, that was the first question and a whole series of many questions to follow that led me on an amazing path of discovery. I thought what I would do is just spend maybe a few weeks looking over John's notes and maybe doing a little independent research. We'd uh, write a magazine article or produce a film strip or something like that, and we'd explain what's going on and blow away the opposition, and that would be the end of it. Little did I know the voltage in the wire that I was about to grab hold of. The voltage in the medical wire, the treatment of cancer, the amount of money involved in all of this, the prestige, the reputations, the momentum of the whole cancer industry was so huge. And I had no inkling of it when I stepped into that circle with John to see what I could do to help him. But with the asking of that question, who are they, John, that was the beginning of a journey that I'm still on, by the way. I'm still finding the answer to that question. And it's an amazing story, and I'm going to share some of it with you today. Now, I've got to uh, condense all this down, so let me move right ahead. You know, they say you're supposed to condense, 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 get it short so people can remember it and understand it. So I've decided to condense this whole story of the science and the politics, both, into 35 words so we can have an early lunch. 